Good morning. As uh, as we were singing, I, a scripture came to mind, and I want to thank you for uh, pastor appreciation. Really, you've been treating me good all month. You treat me good all the time. But there was a scripture that immediately came to my mind, and you don't have to turn there. But uh, I've been I've been here going on four years now. So, seems like it just yesterday in some respects. In other ways, it seems a lot longer. But. Uh, <laughs> And I'm sure you feel the same, right? Uh, uh, I want to say I do love you and I appreciate you. I, I, just a scripture came to mind from Paul. He's writing to the Thessalonians, and, and we, we talk about the crowns. I'm going to wear a crown one day, and most theologians believe there's like five crowns you can win. The martyr crown, soul winner crown. But Paul says this. He says, for what is our hope or joy or our crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. And I feel kind of like Paul as I look around and I look at you. And, uh, and who knows if I'll have any crowns, whatever. But, but seeing you in the presence of God on that day, Hallelujah. that's going to be my joy be. and my crown. And I love you and I'm, I'm here to serve you. And, uh, and I appreciate your kindness and uh, your prayers that you've shown to me. And I'm not going to start crying. Let's get in God's word. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you will, to the, the third book of the Old Testament, which is Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25. You say, well, Henry, I thought we were in Ruth. We are. <laughs> Leviticus 25. And we're going to begin reading in verse 23. Leviticus 25 is the third book of the Old Testament. Beginning in verse 23. The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine. Who's speaking here? God. You know, it's funny that the whole world concerns itself with this little piece of real estate in the Middle East. And they, can, they want to parse it out to this group and that group. But who does it belong to? God. Even to this day, they're, they're fighting over this little piece of real estate. But anyway, the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. Okay? So anytime the land was sold, it was basically like a lease agreement because the land belonged to God. It was never to pass uh, out of the, the possession of the children of Israel. So even if a piece of land was sold, it was almost like a you could lease the rights to use the land to farm it or do whatever. There was always a redemption granted for the land. This is important. And if your brother be waxing poor and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man hath none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. That was this 50th year uh, where everything, all debts were canceled, slaves were set free, and property was returned to its owner. And it says, and in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return into his possession. So uh, basically you had a 50-year window, and... Uh, Everything was based off the year of Jubilee, and they would kind of prorate it if they buy the land back based on how many years. All right, now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, and that's just two books over. You've got Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25. And we've been talking about this in, uh, in previous weeks, about the Leveret marriage. Deuteronomy 25. <coughs> And then we'll begin in verse 5. It says, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry unto a stranger, without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. So having the name, that was the worst thing that could happen 
to an Israelite is that his name would be blotted out, would cease to exist. It was the worst possible uh, scenario. If the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders. The, my husband, and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, and he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city, of his city, shall call him, and shall speak unto him, and if he stand to it, and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders, and loose his shoe from off of his foot, and spit in his face. Interesting custom. And shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, The house of him that hath his shoe loosed. And all of God's people said, Thank you that I don't live under the old covenant at this point. Now, let's turn to Ruth chapter 4. It's just a few more books over. Not, you're not going to have to do a whole lot of turning this morning. Ruth chapter 4. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word. Thank you for your, uh, your grace. Thank you that you were willing to pay the price for our redemption. And uh, you were able, you, you were willing, and you were able to meet all the obligations of our redemption, Lord. And we're so thankful. And you're a near kinsman, Lord. You're a true Goel because you became one of us. And uh, we're thankful for Bethlehem. We're thankful for the bread of life that was born in Bethlehem. Today I pray that you'd add your blessing to the reading of the word and guide me as I attempt to preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last week we left off with the threshing floor scene where Ruth proposes to Boaz there in the threshing floor. And uh, we, we talked a lot about how uh, this, this concept of a kinsman redeemer, a goel, and Boaz met the requirements. But there was one small problem. We were not able to have a happy ending in chapter 3. Because Boaz said that there is a redeemer that's closer of kin than I. And so we've got to give him the right of first refusal. And if he's not willing or able, then I will do the role of the kinsman redeemer, the Goel. Now this is significant to me on so many levels. But I want you to just think of it just strictly from a human perspective. I mean, at this point... Boaz is a wealthy person. He's probably well known in the city. He's probably a prominent person. Let's, let's just be real. If he doesn't want to, he, does, he probably doesn't even have to check with this near kinsman. I mean, after all, all this time has gone by, and he hasn't made a move uh, to do anything about Ruth. And so they could just probably elope and go, you know, they could go somewhere and have a, just have a shotgun wedding. They could go to Las Vegas and, and uh, have an Elvis impersonator do a uh, shotgun wedding. And they could come back into town and probably nobody would, I mean, nobody would raise an eyebrow, right? I mean, we love each other. Boaz loves Ruth. Ruth obviously loves Boaz. And, you know, why go through all the formalities of it? We'll just, let's just get her done. Just get it over with, and let's get on about with the business of living. But what we see here in Boaz is a resolve to do the right thing, regardless of who's watching or who's not watching, regardless of, of convenience. It's not convenient for him, but remember that Boaz is a type. Now, he's not, you know, he, we can't exactly say that he's Jesus or that he represents God but he's a type of the near kinsman redeemer who is Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth and he lived under the law, did he take any shortcuts? No. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. 
He said, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall pass away until all is fulfilled. And so, in a sense, Boaz is, uh, he's acting just like Christ is going to act when he comes to earth uh, a thousand years later, or whenever, however long it was. And he's going to follow every letter of the law. Jesus is going to keep the law perfectly. There's only one man who has ever kept the law of Moses, all 613. It's not just the Ten Commandments. There's only one person who has ever kept all 613 commandments and never sinned. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. He is the only one. And so I believe that we see here in Boaz a righteous resolve to follow all of the requirements of the law. So, how did we leave things last? Naomi and Ruth are waiting with bated breath. And she tells Ruth to sit still because this man is not going to rest until he has settled the matter. And we pick up in chapter 4, verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. Now the gate of the city, that would be an interesting Bible study for you. We find a lot of things happening at the gate of the city. The gate of the city was the place of concourse. It was a place of social interaction. It was a place where legal matters were settled. Uh, if someone were seeking refuge or asylum there, uh, the elders of the city would, would make a determination there. Uh, weddings and uh, land transfers, all of these kind of legal processes would be uh, adjudicated in the gate of the city. And we find a lot of things happening in the gate of the city. Interestingly enough, and you read about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, and I've already told you, I think that's Ruth, that she's the model of the virtuous woman. But what does it also say about the virtuous woman? Her husband is known where? In the gates. He's known in the gates. He's a man of integrity. He's a man, uh, he's a prominent citizen. He's a person of honor, a person, a leader. And so he goes to the gate of the city. This is where this transaction would take place. And we, we get the impression that Boaz, uh, pardon the expression, he didn't let any grass grow under his feet. You know, he's, he's right on it, just like Naomi anticipated. He comes and he sits down there. So now we have Ruth is seated at the end of chapter 3, and Boaz is seated in chapter 4. You and I, if we're believers in Christ, we're seated together with him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Boaz is seated at the gate. And, and look what's going to happen. Behold, that's a, a, a dynamic term in the Old Testament here. Whenever you see behold, it's like, wow, we're watching this happen here. Behold, guess who just happens to come walking by? The kinsman of whom Boaz spake of came by. Just like Ruth just happened to go into the field that belonged to Boaz. What's interesting in the story of Ruth and Boaz, uh, this whole book, is that it's not a lot of signs and wonders and miraculous things that we think of when we talk about miracles but it's ordinary people doing ordinary things and all the while God in his providence is causing all things to work together for good to those that love him to those that are the called according to his purpose and you know the same things happening in your life and in my life we think we're not living these exciting extraordinary lives we think well I'm just an ordinary person living in a small town and and just doing ordinary things. Guess what? That's the kind of people that God uses. And that's the kind of people that God loves to work providentially in their lives. So you're a candidate. If you're an ordinary folk just like me. You're a candidate for the extraordinary power of God to be at work in your life. People who experience tragedy and sorrow. And dare I say disappointment. Naomi was disappointed with God in the first chapter was she not? She was bitter, so much so that she couldn't even stand the, the, the sound of her own name. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me beautiful. But call me Mara. I'm bitter. God has dealt me a, 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 a bitter pill to swallow. But here comes the near kinsman. Now, chances are, I think Boaz... I think Boaz is a whole lot smarter than we give him credit for. And I think Boaz has been doing a lot of research. Have you noticed that every time somebody tries to inform Boaz about something, he already knows what's going on? <laughs> you know, he, he asks, whose damsel is this? And then when him and Ruth start talking, and Boaz is like, yeah, I already know all about you, Ruth. 
Uh, it's been told to me, all the kindness that you've shown to your family. And, and I just believe that Boaz knew what time of day Mr. So-and-so is going to come walking by. I believe that Boaz had already, I don't believe that there's, now as we read the story here, uh, in a few verses our hearts are going to drop down to our sock. And we're going to think, oh man, this thing's going to go sideways. But I think Boaz knew all along how this thing was going to go. I believe that he had carefully thought and planned out how this whole endeavor was going to go down in the gate of the city. So the man just happens to come by and he said, I love how the King James praises it. Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. Now, uh, some of your translations may say, friend, have a seat, something like that. In the Hebrew, and I'm not going to pronounce it for you because I, I don't think I can get it just right in the Hebrew, so I, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But this is a Hebrew idiom, and here's what it means in English. Hey, Mr. So-and-so, come over here and sit down. Here comes Mr. So-and-so. How about that? We've all been there, haven't we? You go to the grocery store or Walmart or the, and, and somebody runs into you and you haven't seen them in a long time and they say, hey there, Sherry, how are you doing? It's been a long time. You remember me, don't you? And Sherry goes, yeah. <laughs> how you doing there, champ? <laughs> it's been a long time, sport. <laughs> Friend? <laughs> or if they're a Christian, hey there, brother, yeah. Next time somebody comes up to you and you don't know who they are, say, how you doing there, Mr. So-and-so? <laughs> Ho, such a one. And they'll look at you like you're crazy, and then they'll go on, and you won't have to even deal with it anymore. <laughs> now, Boaz knows who the guy is, obviously, right? I believe the narrator knows who the guy is. And so he is deliberately anonymous. He's just Mr. So-and-so in the story. And I believe we'll find out why here in just a moment. Turn aside, sit down here. And lo and behold, he turned aside and sat down. Okay. So obviously Boaz is a person of influence. Was it E.F. Hutton that they used to say when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen? And some of you aren't old enough to understand that. And some of you are longer in the tooth and you totally get that reference. But when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. When Boaz talks, people listen. And he sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city. This number ten is uh, it's an important number in the Bible. Uh, there, it's significant that there were ten commandments that was representative of the whole, 613. Ten is a number of testimony. And ten is factored in prominently in this particular book as well. Uh, how many years were they in Moab? Roughly ten years. And they experienced uh, famine there. And they experienced heartache and tragedy. There's ten men of the city. And at the end of this book here, there's a genealogy that encompasses ten generations. Interesting. Ten is a number of testimony. Now, it's said in Jewish tradition that it takes at least ten men to, to have a, uh, for a, a synagogue to be legitimate. You've got to have at least ten men. Uh, those of you who are familiar with parliamentary procedure would say, well, you've got to have X amount of people in a meeting in order for it to be valid. And we would call that, what, a quorum. Okay. You, can't, you can't have a meeting with two people if you've got 300 members of, you know, of an organization and say that that meeting was legitimate. But, uh, so you've got to have a quorum here. So you've got 10 men of the city, and these would have been this would have been a quorum, if I can say it that way. This would have, been, uh, a, a this would have made this proceeding a legal hearing. And he said unto them, sit down here, and what do they do? They sat down. Again, Boaz talks and people listen. I wonder if you ask people to sit down if they would listen to you. Or if they say, I ain't got time for this. <laughs> Leave me alone. Li hey, I, you, we're laughing about this. But live your life in such a way that when you need somebody to listen to you, they'll listen. Remember when Lot tried to get the people to listen to him? Hey, God's going to destroy the city. You've got to leave Sodom. But, it seemed, but he seemed like he was crazy to his family. Even his own family said, oh, just be quiet, Lot. So live your life in such a way that you have an audience with those who, who you intend to speak into. He said unto the kinsman, verse 3, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, sells a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, 
or I thought to disclose it to you. And before the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it besides you, and I am after you. And Mr. So-and-so said, sounds like a good deal. Land is a, land is a precious commodity. I can use this. To, this is going to be profitable for me. And, the, uh, and Mr. So-and-so says, I will redeem it. And at this point, our hearts sink. This is what you don't want to happen when you go to a romantic movie, a rom-com. This is not what you want. You don't want Mr. So-and-so, you know, if, uh, I don't know who's supposedly a good-looking guy now. I don't know. Tom Cruise was the guy back in the day. But, you know, if Tom Cruise is supposed to marry the, the good-looking girl, you don't want Danny DeVito stepping in. <laughs> See, I'm trying to give you a visual here so you can understand. <laughs> and here's Danny DeVito, and he says, well, you know what? I'll do it. <laughs> and if Ruth is standing by, we don't know if she is or not, but if she is, she's probably thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Boaz, what are you doing? What have you done? I knew we should have eloped. <laughs> we should have just gone to Vegas. I've been to some weddings. I've officiated with some weddings, and I thought these guys should have gone to the courthouse or to Vegas or something. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. This is why I read to you from Exodus, excuse me, from Leviticus, is to see the right of redemption, okay? Obviously, Elimelech had to sell the property when they left, and he probably used the money to live off of it, you know, to try to survive in Moab. And, and now Naomi is in the position of having to sell it. The rights to it, rather. Her and uh, Naomi and Ruth. And the guy says, I will redeem it. It sounds like a good deal. Well, land, they're not making any more of that, are they? Brother Anthony. <laughs> they don't make any more land. That stuff's precious. And they think a lot of their land nowadays, don't they? <laughs> you know, just check your property taxes if you don't believe it. They think a lot of it. But, uh, but Boaz, he's not rattled the least bit. Now, why doesn't Boaz, right out of the gate, say, okay, look, there's a parcel of land, and there's a Moabite woman as part of the deal. He doesn't do that. He introduces, first of all, just the land. And on, at, on the surface, the guy says, this sounds like a great deal. And then he says, well, <coughs> well there's, there's, another, there's another clause here that we have to, there's another matter that we need to tend to. What day that you buy the field of the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it of Ruth, the Moabitess. <laughs> he just kind of throws that in there for emphasis, just in case we forgot where she was from. We've been kind of hit over the head with a hammer on this. She's not from around here. Uh, she's the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, well, that changes things. <laughs> That's going to be a deal breaker for me. Have you ever thought something was a great deal until they started giving you all the terms and conditions? And you said, uh, you know what? I'm going to have to take a rain check on that. I'll come back to you. So the kinsman said, notice he says what he says. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself. Notice it's important he does not say, I will not. That's important. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I borrow my inheritance. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture about this. Let me finish it. Redeem, you, uh, redeem thou my right to yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Not will not, but cannot redeem it. Now, here is where, remember that whole issue of the loosening of the shoe and the spitting in the face and all that kind of stuff we read about? This is how this is different. This is not a Deuteronomy 25 scenario here. This is not, number one, it's not a brother. He's, he's a, probably a cousin or something. He's not a, a, a blood brother. And this, also, this is not Ruth coming to the gate of the city. Remember in Deuteronomy, the woman, the wife comes there and she calls for the elders of the city. Here, who has initiated this whole discourse? Boaz has. Boaz has initiated. So the woman has not initiated. And also, we don't have an unwilling Goel. He doesn't say, I won't do it. He says, I can't do it, okay? And so that's why there's no spitting of the face and that whole thing. This is not a transaction of shame for this man. 
Now, some, tra- some commentators say that it's a, it's a transaction of shame, and that's why his name is not mentioned. And, uh, you know, he's trying to preserve his name, and his name's blotted out. I don't think that's what's going on. That's just my opinion. I think the reason, I think the reason that the near kinsman, the nearest kinsman, is not named is because he is an idiom of the law. And the law is holy and good. There's nothing wrong with the law, but there's a problem with the law. Romans, Paul said in Romans that the law can't save us because it was weak (laughs) through the flesh. And so the law can never save you. The only thing that can save you is the grace of God. Nothing wrong with the law. Nothing wrong with it. The law's good. And I believe this kinsman redeemer here, he's probably a good guy. That's why there's no ignominious overtones here. He's not being spit in his face. He's not being called old Mr. Shoe Looser over here. He's just Mr. So-and-so. But the law cannot save. And I believe that's why he's, he's anonymous here. And he says, I cannot redeem it. Now in verse 7, we get a little clue here that this practice is no longer being practiced at the time that the book is written. Otherwise, there's no need to explain it. Amen? Amen. I, I, I amen myself. That's... That's the best way to get one, Henry. Okay. Now, this is the manner in the form of time of Israel. Concerning redeeming and concerning, concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. So, they're explaining the custom, which obviously they're not doing anymore. Otherwise, there's no need to, uh, to explain it. Now, why was, the, uh, why was the shoe? What's that all about? Now, I believe... And, and I've, I've read some other commentaries that hold a similar view. You know, whenever God told Abraham to go throughout the land, he told him wherever your feet, the, the sole of your feet tread that belongs to you. And the treading of the foot uh, represents the, light, the right of the land to the individual because you trod it underfoot. So, in verse 8, the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for you. And he drew off his sandal. I I just love this. I love it. I love it. I love the drama of it all. He he draws off his sandal. This, by the way, this would be his title deed. This would be Boaz's title deed. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people. You get the impression that a crowd has gathered. (laughs) What's going on here? Boaz is having a meeting. (laughs) Must be pretty important that Boaz has got the elders sitting in the city. Boaz is a wealthy man. This is a big deal. So I, I just imagine in my mind's eye that there's a, a right fair amount of people that have gathered. And, uh, and Boaz is not the least bit ashamed, is he? He's proud. Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, you are witnesses this day. Oh, I love it. Amen. Can you just feel the legal overtones to all this, this whole thing? Boaz says, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Killian's and all that was Machlon's of the hand of Naomi. I bought the whole thing. I paid it all. I paid the price. Are Are you getting it? Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess the wife of Machlon. This is the first time we learned which brother was married to Ruth. We weren't told whether it was Machlon or Killian until now. Now we get full disclosure. You know, sometimes God doesn't let you in on all the details right up front. You had to walk through it. It's only now that we learned that Machlon was the one who was married to Ruth. The wife of Machlon, have I purchased to be my wife? Interesting. Not only did he purchase the land, but he purchased the woman. He bought the person. He bought Ruth to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. Now again, part of this deal uh, for the near kinsman, not only did he have to marry Ruth, but he would have to raise up a son and that son, by the way, would not be his. Okay? So think about the financial obligation upon Mr. So-and-so. Presumably, he's probably married. And Boaz knows this. I mean, he knows how this whole thing is going to go. 
So more than likely, the guy's married. He may have kids with his wife. And so if he takes on Ruth as his wife, number one, that's going to cause some problems at home. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> yeah, all you wives are like, yeah, it's going to be a big problem. <laughs> going to be a big, big problem at home. Uh, and she's a Moabitess. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an issue there too. But think about it. If he has a son with Ruth, then the son is not going to be his. And then the field is not going to be his. He's going to lose his investment. So uh, that's, that's why he was not able to do it financially. But does Boaz need another field? Is Boaz down there because he's concerned with real estate? I got 100 acres. I need 200 more. Right? No. No. This is going to shed some light on some of these New Testament parables that we don't, you know, we read them and we don't really fully grasp them, I don't think. You ever read over there in Matthew 13 where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a field that a man buys? And in the field there's a treasure. Let me just read that really quick. You don't have to turn there. Matthew 13, verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hidden in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hides, and for joy thereof, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. You know the funny thing about a pearl? To a Jewish person, that would be a non-kosher thing, because oysters are unclean. I wonder what the original audience thought about that. An outsider an unclean, a non-kosher. It's like a pearl. A, 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 a merchant seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Boaz found a treasure in the field. Oh, hallelujah. Boaz found a treasure in the field. You see, the other kinsman... He was worried about what it would cost him. He said, I can't pay the price. It's too much for me. But for Boaz, he said, no matter what it costs me, I don't care. I'm willing to pay the price for the treasure that he found in the field. Amen. The field was just, you know, a side thing. The real treasure was Ruth. Amen. And can I say to you, that you are of more value than many sparrows. Every hair on your head is numbered. That you were redeemed not with silver and gold. But with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. A lamb without spot and without blemish. Amen. You see there was four things about the kinsman redeemer. There's, I've always been saying three but there's really four. Number one to be a kinsman redeemer. You had to be a, a close kinsman. You had to be a relative. That's why Christmas is significant. That's why Jesus came to be born in Bethlehem. That's why God became a human. That's why Jesus didn't come here as, a, as an angel. He came here as a Jew to redeem them that were under the law. The next condition is he had to be able to, to pay the price. He had to have sufficient means to do it. Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. He owns all things. He's not just uh, the owner of all things. He's the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Thirdly, he had to be willing to do it. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. He died willingly. And fourthly, and as what we see here in, the near, in the Mr. So-and-so, the kinsman had to be uh, willing to meet all of the obligations. See, at first glance, he was ready to buy the field, but when he found out all the obligations, Mr. So-and-so couldn't fulfill them. But Christ was willing to meet all of the obligations. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it's possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'll do it, Lord. He willingly went to the cross. <clears throat> Verse 11. By the way, we're not finishing Ruth today. Sorry. <laughs> and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. I just envisioned this being a joyous, 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 joyous thing. 
I mean, I, I believe the people probably loved Boaz. I believe he was a beloved figure in the city. And this guy's probably been alone for a long time. And Ruth, everybody knows what kind of woman Ruth is. Amen? Even Boaz said this. And I believe they said, isn't this the perfect wedding? A righteous man and a virtuous woman with a pure love who love one another. And they said, we are witnesses. They said, the Lord. Is it all caps in your Bible in verse 11? That's Jehovah, right? That's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. And Jehovah, make the woman that is coming to your house like Rachel and like Leah. Wow. That's pretty big shoes to fill. Which two did build the house of Israel? Now, it wasn't without a little strife and trouble. You ever read Genesis? I mean, it was anything but happily ever after with Leah and Rachel. It was a whole lot of strife and contention there. And do thou worthily in Ephratah, and this is the ancient name for uh, Bethlehem, by the way, Ephratah, and be famous in Bethlehem. Well, did their wish come true? I think so. We're talking about them today. Boaz and Ruth are famous in Bethlehem. And then you, 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 you fast forward several hundreds of years, and you get to the, the narrative of the gospel, and you find these shepherds, and there's a, there's a multitude of angels that come. <laughs> rejoicing and guess where they are they're in the fields of Boaz and Ruth <laughs> this whole thing God's got this whole thing you know he's the he declares the end from the beginning let your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman now we read it and we think yeah that sounds good have you ever read the story of Judah and Perez pretty scandalous a whole affair. Judah goes into this Canaanite prostitute, he thinks, but it's his daughter-in-law. And so if somebody had said to me at my wedding day, your house be like the house of Pharaohs, I might say, same to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but see, all of this is playing into the providence of God. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and he went into her. This is a euphemism, of course. And I think we're all familiar with it, so I don't need to expound on it in Hebrew or in Greek. <laughs> but it also shows that that incident on the threshing floor was not a consummation of a wedding night. The idea here, you know, I could, I could preach a marriage seminar off of the book of Ruth. How much time you got? Well, I'm just kidding. I won't do it. <laughs> Maybe next week, preacher, not today. Not today. And he went into her. Now, notice it says that Jehovah... The Lord gave her conception. Remember what her problem was? They're, they had two problems. Naomi and Ruth had two problems. Number one, they were out of food. And number two, they, had, they couldn't have no babies. Right? Ruth was barren. So the only way she's going to conceive is if God helps her. This is also a sanctity of life kind of thing here. When does life begin? At conception. That's when life begins. The Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And I'm going to stop there. And you might think, well, this is, this is a good stopping point. If we were filming a movie, we might say, roll the credits. But the story doesn't stop here. Normally, you find a genealogy at the beginning of a book. But in Ruth, curiously enough, genealogy ends, is at the end of the book. And what does that tell us? It tells us that this story is a microcosm of something that's much bigger, a macro issue. And I would say to you that your life and my life, no matter how seemingly insignificant or anonymous we may feel that we are, is part of something much bigger. Your life matters. Your life. I always love during the Christmas season to, to watch It's a Wonderful Life. I just, I love it. I don't get my theology from it. Don't get your theology from the movies. But I just, I look. It's a great story about how one man's life makes a difference. Or one woman. What would the world be like if you weren't here? Well, the world would be a much different place. And I, for one, I'm glad you're here. I want to read you something that Warren Wiersbe wrote. If you ever want some light reading before you go to bed, come see me. 
in his commentary on the Old Testament. This is, from, this is from Brother Warren. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. The book of Ruth opens with three funerals, but it closes with a wedding. There is a good deal of weeping recorded in the first chapter, but the last chapter records an overflowing of joy in the little town of Bethlehem. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Here we go. Not all of life's stories have this kind of happy ending. But this little book reminds us that for the Christian, God writes the last chapter. We don't have to be afraid of the future. I don't know what's going on in your story right now. I don't know what chapter you're in. For some of you, it's pretty tough. Some of you are going through some hard stuff right now. And I want you to know you're not alone. Your church family loves you. We pray for you. We care for you. We lift you up. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about the plight that some of you are in and the challenges that you're in. And know this, that if I care, how much more does God care? How much more does the Lord care? Remember this, no matter what you're going through, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the story ends well for you, my friend. There is a happy ending for you. There is a, forget about happy, there's a glorious ending for you. Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in you and me. Would you stand this morning? If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, here's the interesting thing about the story. No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he did not make a move until she laid a claim on him. God loves you. God died on the cross for you in the person of Jesus Christ. The cross is God screaming, I love you. Paul says God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But no matter how much God loves you, you will never enter into a relationship with him until you personally, you yourself, not on your mom and dad's coattails, not your grandparents, but you yourself come and lay your claim and say, I want you to be my redeemer. I have faith in you. Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Just like Boaz did not refuse Ruth when she came and claimed him as her redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ will not reject you if you come to him and claim him as your redeemer. You can do that this morning. Or maybe, just maybe, you're like Naomi in the first chapter. And you've gone through so much disappointment, so much heartache, so much bitterness, that you wonder if the story is ever going to work out in your favor. And I'm here to tell you, That if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what it looks like, God is working together all things for your good because he loves you with an everlasting love. Would you come?